All right, so, so the, the topic of my discussion today is valuing feedstocks for anaerobic digestion and, and balancing energy potential along with nutrient content and, and looking at that from a big picture perspective. Um, the team of Michigan State's myself, uh, Louis Faber is our technician and, and responsible for conducting a lot of our tests. And then Dr. Safran and Dr. Liao uh, are the other two members of, of the Anaerobic Digestion Research and Education Center. So as was discussed earlier, um, anaerobic digestion, there's roughly 190 systems on farms in the United States today or at the end of uh, 2012. It's up from 150 in 2010, uh, so we've, we've gained about 20 systems per year. It, it's not a rapid rate of growth. And in the system, you know, there, it's, it's been about 15 to 20 systems per year probably for the last uh, five to eight years. So. Uh, the industry is a little stagnant. Um, we're not going to make the, the targets uh, that were outlined by the MOU between USDA and, and the uh, dairy producers a few years back where we're, we want to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from milk by 20% by 2020, and we're by no means growing like the Europeans are growing. Of course, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, there are a lot of challenges with our anaerobic digestion systems, and it's not necessarily the technology, but it's all the things that are, are associated or surrounding the technology. Revenue generation, of course, is very difficult. Uh, our energy prices are relatively low, and according to current trends, electricity and natural gas are going lower. So uh, we're not going to make a lot of money on those things. Assessing these environmental benefits are, are, can sometimes be tricky, and it's not so much assessing them, but finding a market for them. Uh, we do have a good opportunity in California with the, uh, the, the, the things that are going on there, but it's a matter now, can we get these carbon credits and RINs, and, and how do we uh, monetize these and, and how does that fit into our whole economic equation. Access to markets is a challenge. You know, we have a lot of livestock farms that may not be on three-phase power, they might not be near a uh, natural gas pipeline, and so how do we get the products that we're producing out to customers? Uh, and, and sometimes the utilities aren't always uh, easiest to work with when it comes to, to getting to these markets. So that's a challenge and, and it's going to depend state by state. Capital costs are there, they are, they are still relatively high. Uh, probably not going to change much here in the near future. For the dairy farmers in Michigan, manure nutrient management is an issue. You know, they, the dairy farmers say, listen, you, you know, anaerobic digestion doesn't solve our issue. Our issue is moisture and water in the manure. Uh, the digester doesn't address that. So, so that's one of the limits that we face in, in the Midwest. Feedstock availability. So if you're looking to co-digest with other things, are there feedstocks available to boost the energy production? Uh, how easy is it get, to get to those? How close are they? What's the transportation logistics and costs associated with it? And there's also some technology gaps still. I mean, there's a lot of work being done to address nutrient recovery. So how do we address this issue of nutrient management through nutrient separations and recovery technologies? Uh, we'll hear more about that, I think, later today and tomorrow. Uh, but there's a lot of work being done there. The other, the other area that's of great interest is the CNG conversion. And, and how do we take biogas and convert it into to renewable CNG? Um, but how can we convert our vehicles in the economical matter so that we can actually use that CNG and, and do it on a large scale? So these are some of the challenges. Um, the majority of my talks are going to face focus on this revenue generation and how can we use non-farm feedstocks to address nutrient or uh, revenue generation and hopefully create projects that are economic, economically viable. So using non-farm feedstocks, there are a lot of pros and cons that go along with that. One, typically they do uh, generate a lot of energy potential. They are energy dense materials. Um, uh, it, the other side of the equation is they do carry generally a lot of nutrients. And so uh, I'll get more into that. How do we view that? Is, is, a, is that a pro or is that a con for us? Tipping fees. Uh, tipping fees are still a reality in a lot of markets, though they are market driven and, and competition driven. Infrastructure, regulatory management. So if we're going to use non-farm feedstocks, uh, what other changes to the system do we need to incorporate those from the standpoint of infrastructure? Do we need receiving pits? Do we need grinders? Uh, do we need access uh, for truck traffic? Regulatory goes state by state. Um, in Michigan, we can blend up to 20% and maintain our general permits. If we want to go above 20%, we have to go to an individual permit, and that opens us up to some public comment and some public scrutiny. Uh, that we wouldn't normally be under. And then management. So there's going to be record keeping associated with it. Now we have uh, trucks that may be coming in from non-farm that we don't control. So how do we manage those things and, and how much labor is associated with that? So a disclaimer, the, the data that I'm going to show here in the next few slides is more for order of magnitude and for discussion purposes and to represent uh, how these non-farm feedstocks change revenues. Um, 
they are from a limited sample set of our overall collection of information. So, you know, there may be some discrepancies from the numbers that you're used to seeing as far as what we've seen. Um, and we can talk more about that, I guess, if there's a specific question. So, energy potential. This is a picture from our uh, digester on campus that's operating today. Um, when you mix manure with food waste, especially cafeteria food waste, we have a lot of uneaten vegetables on campus. So our students prefer french fries over pineapple and apples and everything else, I guess. Uh, but it does generate ener energy and it does, uh, it does change the dynamics of the system. At ADREC, uh, we do do a lot of feedstock evaluations. Um, we have a database that summarizes uh, the raw characteristics, our normalized gas production, our ma maximum met methane concentration. We generally have grouped this into 14 categories. In the, this is just a snapshot of, of a few of the categories. And we have acid foods, bakery waste, blended materials, um, dairy manures, dairy processed wastes. This 14 general categories links up with our, our Michigan Biomass Inventory. So we have an inventory that shows you where all the food processors, uh, universities, correctional facilities, uh, dairy farms, CAFOs are in the state. So you can link these two together and get an idea if you're a biogas developer, how much feedstock is there and then what is the general energy potential of it. So to date, or as of uh, about a year ago, we've done 558, uh, we, had five, we had 558 uh, independent data points in this collection, so, um, and that's what I'm pulling from for the discussion. As it was discussed in the previous few slides, um, there is great potential when we look at biomass and cubic feet per ton of all solids across a variety of feedstocks. And there is a lot of variability. Uh, I do have dairy manure in here as kind of a baseline. This is uh, a very dilute dairy manure from a local farm. But then we look at cheese waste, fish oval, fog, uh, has a very high energy potential mixed food waste. But when we look at it on a per ton of all solids, there, there's not a lot of differentiation. And it was discussed in a, in a previous slide. That goes back to not all feedstocks carry the same solids content. They are very dilute uh, to very high solids. So when we factor in the total of all the solids, it tends to change how we do these feedstocks quite a bit. And our dairy manure, while still a good feedstock because it does carry the buffering capacity and the, the microorganisms that we're looking for, it's relatively very low energy potential when we look at cubic feet per ton as is. So per ton uh, of material, including the, the moisture content that comes with it. Our fogs generally will stay pretty high because they can be relatively thick and materials provide a lot of water to them. Food processing waste generally can be very high, though. Again, this is just a small snapshot of a couple of food processors. Uh, and these actually happen to come from uh, frozen taco and uh, frozen food factories. So these are actually uh, pretty dense materials in this case. Glycerin is another one that's typically very good. Uh, and I threw switchgrass in there for Charles. So um, when we look at it on the per ton as is, we do see a lot of difference in that. And it helps us to start to judge uh, how these different feedstocks can impact our energy potentials better. <clears throat> so when we talk feedstocks and nutrients, that's another, another big area that uh, is sometimes overlooked on these. And, and it really varies if you're the, the digester developer and you want to just own the system, or if you're the farmer and it's going to be on your farm and you're going to have to deal with the digestate that comes out of it. So again, looking at kind of a small sample set here, um, and looking at our P205 and our total nitrogens, you know, per ton as it comes in, we range anywhere from maybe as low as three uh, pounds per ton P205 in, in fog uh, up to as much as 120 or almost 120 pounds per ton with some food wastes. That's a big window. And, and as you start to look at this from an agronomic standpoint, uh, that really changes how you want to view these. And, and the other question is, can we now extract these nutrients post-digester with some sort of nutrient recovery technology and put those in a form uh, where these can actually become uh, a fertilizer for sale. And I do have total nitrogen down here. I'm not going to talk much about nitrogen because it changes so much during digestion and it, is, and it has so much potential to volatize afterwards. So I did include it because it's here, but I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. So again, when we look at uh, agronomic land-based requirements, if we want to look at using this as on the phosphorus basis. So Michigan is a phosphorus-based state, a lot of surface water. So we're trying to keep uh, the, the agronomic usage of phosphorus to a two-year max. So when you apply, you can apply for one or two years, but nothing beyond two years. Um, as we look down this list and we see the variability, per, the acres that are required to utilize this range anywhere from less than 0.2 acres for alfalfa and corn silages and, and, and corn grain, where fog is very low, 
uh, to as high as 1.1 to 2.5 acres if you're on a wheat crop that's not using as much phosphorus. So you got to think about, okay, I've got a truck coming in today and it has 10 tons of material X on it, which in this case we'll say is mixed food waste. I now have to have 20 acres of cropland to utilize that phosphorus. Uh, if I don't have a way to separate that and put it into a, a usable form that can be moved off farm. So, in this case, the nutrients could be a, tr a tremendous liability uh, and, and really cause the farmer challenges. And, and we've spent a lot of time with some farmers in the Midwest who are looking at bringing in off-farm feedstocks. Uh, I'm characterizing that and looking at these nutrient concentrations and how that impacts their, uh, their nutrient management agronomy. Again, you see similar trends for, for nitrogen. Uh, again, this is assuming zero volatilization, um, but you know, a tenth of an acre up to as much as 3.3 acres for uh, a wheat crop. So there's a lot of variability there in the in the nitrogen as well. But again, it, you could have a potentially large land base required for those feedstocks. So those are the two potential liability sides of it. If we can start to extract these nutrients and put them into a concentrated form where we can sell them against the commercial commercial nutrient market. Um, we can start to generate significant revenues there. So we can look at, you know, based on today's phosphorus prices, you know, anywhere from $2 to uh, $60 per ton coming in is potentially the, the phosphate value of that material if we have a use for it. So there is a tremendous potential for revenue, uh, again, finding the right value in, in the right situations. Again, similar trend for nitrogen. If we can keep all of that nitrogen and not lose uh, nitrogen to volatilization, uh, you know, we can see the tremendous value per ton uh, on the nitrogen side as well. But again, it's a matter of, of finding that situation where we can extract that and putting that into a usable form. So tipping fees, again, another topic. Um, this is uh, our digester getting tipped uh, with, feed, with food waste from one of our dorms on, on campus or one of our resident halls, they're no longer called dorms. Uh, so we're getting uh, at this digester three or four loads a week of of pulped food waste. Nationally, tipping fees on landfills rate cost or are range from as low as, well, I say the national average for tipping fees at landfills is about $18.5 per ton based on municipal solid waste. Uh, when you look at the largest public and private landfills, it's actually pretty close to about $50 per ton nationwide. Uh, the highest cost in the nation, of course, are in the East Coast, where you could be looking at uh, upwards of well over $100 per ton for MSW. Disposal of landfills, I think New York City is around $140 a ton, um, whereas the western states are typically on the lower end of that tipping fee cost. So depending on where you're at nationally, you're going to see a lot of variability uh, in, that, in that potential revenue side. There, there's a lot of variability, again, depending on the, the characteristics of the material that's being dumped. So if you have MSW and, uh, and other things that fit into the normal operation to flow the landfill, uh, you're going to be pretty close to that value. If you've got a very dilute material, uh, say pineapple trimmings that, that break down, so you have a pineapple cutting facility, which we happen to have in Lansing, uh, we, we, we cut 30 ton a day of pineapple, uh, that, that material liquefies very quickly. And so they actually pay a much higher rate to, to dispose of that at a landfill because the landfill has to incorporate different practices to deal with the moisture content of that material. And then they also have moisture, additional moisture going into that landfill. So there is some variability depending on the waste characteristics. Same thing goes for wastewater. So if you have a material that's currently being disposed of at a wastewater treatment plant, you're going to look at five, or 5 to 15 cents per gallon. Assuming it's water, you know, anywhere from 12 to 36 dollars per ton. Uh, fees will vary depending on solids content, nutrient content. Uh, those are the big drivers when it comes to wastewater. There's also availability. So does a wastewater plant have capacity for you to tip or to dump into them? Uh, in Michigan, we have material that's going over 180 miles to Muskegon for, to, from Detroit to Muskegon because Muskegon's the, about one of the only wastewater plants in the state that actually has capacity for today. So uh, availability to dispose of it can be an issue. Uh, if you're in the right situation, again, you can leverage, leverage your digester to, to capitalize on that and to start to capture some of this revenue. So, what does this all mean? Uh, and I guess I'm just going to put it in terms of, of our projects on campus uh, because that's, I have a lot of familiar, familiar, familiarity with those projects and I have a lot of access to the data. So Michigan State, um, our farms are located immediately adjacent to campus. We have 18,000 students that live on campus, eat on campus every day. 
They serve about 150,000 meals. Uh, we are a CAFO inside of the city limits of East Lansing and Lansing. So we've got some unique characteristics. We also have three golf courses that uh, abut up to our farms. So to the north and west, or north and east. So they're kind of in prime odor location. So we've been looking at an anaerobic digester kind of since 2006, but seriously since 2010. 2006, we really started to look at what are we generating as a campus as far as waste, organic waste materials go. We're doing a lot of recycling cardboard and metals, but what are we doing as far as our organic waste? So for three or four years, we spent a lot of time looking at organic waste uh, characteristics and, and volumes on campus and, and started to um, look at the digester through the College of Ag. The goals, of course, were to generate energy. We also have a very large coal-fired power plant in Michigan State, which our students tend to not like very much. Uh, so we have a lot of kind of unique characteristics. So green energy was a major focus uh, for the administration of the university. Odor control was a major concern for animal science in the university farms. Uh, and then renewable energy credits were of key importance to our power plant. So a lot of interest, a lot of different parties. If we look at our feedstocks available on campus, we only have about 150 to 180 kW potential uh, of energy there. And at that level, it was not economically viable. So hence, it was tabled for, for several years. In 2010, I think we got a little more serious about it. And we, we, we initiated a campus sustainability plan, then we initiated a campus energy transition plan. And uh, the administration said, okay, don't look just at Michigan State now. Let's become good partners with our community and, and let's look at what's available locally. So we started to look at non-farm feedstocks. And I guess I kind of lumped campus into there, so we are bringing food waste in. Um, but what was readily available within the Lansing city limits, seven miles, uh, kind of seven mile radius around our digester, we could easily get enough feedstock to bump our capacity up to almost 400 kW. Uh, it did increase our capital cost projection slightly, about $500,000 $500, for additional storage, uh, as well as receiving areas and, and some pretreatments. But the tipping fees it become a huge piece of our revenue with this. So we are actually able to capture tipping fees uh, from material that was being disposed of in wastewater, as well as material that was being landfilled. We did not view our nutrients as a value, though. We actually view those as a liability. So because we are a landlocked CAFO with a limited land base, we actually have to export a tremendous amount of our manure to stay agronomic. So we actually deducted about $50,000 per year off our business plan to cover the cost of hauling this additional nutrients uh, off campus. So if we can find a way to transform this, I think there's some real value for us, but today that's how we're facing it. Um, with this kind of different view starting in 2010, uh, our business plan flipped from being a not so good business plan to one that the president said, yes, this works. This is a, a demonstration project for the state of Michigan that they can look at. A 200 cow dairy can look at and say, okay, we can build a digester uh, and we can actually have a payback period of seven to 10 years and it becomes a, a major uh, entity on that farm. So, you know, with these different viewpoints, uh, we move forward, we have a business plan that works and we have the blessing now of the Board of Trustees and the administration. Uh, this is kind of our, our campus energy site our composting facility has been here for 10 years or so. Two years ago, we built the plug flow in the algae system that's operating today. And right adjacent to that, now we're building this complete mix system that'll actually be uh, an energy generator for campus. So work started on Monday. I have some pictures to show. Oh, no pictures. Now work did start on Monday. They were supposed to send some pictures today from the site. Uh, they sent them to me about half an hour ago, so I didn't have time to stick them in. But dirt is being moved and concrete will be poured on Monday. So. Uh, we are set to be operational early in July. Uh, everything is on site and ready to go with the exception of CHP, and, and I've been told that that'll be here mid-June. So uh, this project is a go, and uh, we are underway. So kind of some, some, some summary points. Uh, Non-farm substrates do impact business plans tremendously. And I guess I'm a big believer that that is a path forward for us to get past this major hurdle of revenue generation. And we need to look at these substrates uh, and partner with our food processors, and other entities in the rural communities to utilize these and utilize them in a very intelligent way. I think, though, you do need to have caution and do your homework. Uh, understand what the energy potential is. Understand how that ener energy potential is impacted by the composition of the, the non-farm feedstocks. Um, also understand what those nutrients mean and how you can utilize those nutrients in a positive way. Uh, consistency of material can be a problem. So one thing when you're dealing with non-farm feedstocks, Maybe you're on a 60-day contract, uh, so you've got uh, a lot of potential for variability and, and turnover there, so you do need to be prepared for the uncertainty of it. 
Um, and, and get a feel for how it's going to impact your management tip, uh, your your management practices. Um, changing feedstocks are an issue. I think many people that operate digesters can talk about the variability and, and how as more digesters de are developed in the state or in your region, uh, feedstock limitations can be developed as the marketplace changes and maybe the tipping fee goes away at some point because there's so many digesters clamoring to get the material. Uh, don't forget the digest date. Again, you're going to have to store additional material. You're going to have to deal with those additional nutrients. Uh, and understand the regulatory constraints. Start the conversation with your, your EPA folks or DEQ folks early on in the process. Understand how it's going to impact your permits uh, and how you dispose of or utilize the end material there. Questions? So when you get stuff from the students, how good are they at sorting out uh, non or Davis? Is that going to be a problem? It, it, it's a problem. I mean, actually, I think they're doing a good job. I would say ours is probably less than 1% or 2% of the total mass. It's a lot of rubber gloves from the uh, cafeteria workers. Uh, we do get whole bags of salad from time to time. Uh, generally, it hasn't been an issue. We have had some grill fry grates and some big metal pieces that have their made, made their ways in there. Uh, salad tongs are one. Uh, we just try to send them back to the cafeteria so they can reuse them. Um, after they get done damaging our pump, though. <laughs> it, no, it's not yet totally. Yeah, part of it is just time, and we need somebody to, to manage this massive database uh, because we have, you know, we have the 500 and some points, but we also have the pre-characterization, the post-characterization. We have this huge data set, and it's just a matter of time management. So uh, it, it should be readily available here very soon. Parts of it are on our website, but the whole master database is not completely available yet. No, we we blew right by that. We're we're actually pretty close to fifty fifty. And off in in non manure type materials, we were already under an independent or individual permit. Um, it didn't matter to us. You know, again, we're not really a private farm, so, um, and, and again, our DEQ, which is EPA, uh, has been very supportive and, and willing to work with us, again, because we do do the research piece of it, so they can see how does this work on a farm, but in a very controlled setting. What's your health care project We are at 4.6 million. We're approved for up to 5.1, but the, the projection, projected number is 4.6. And part of that is um, we are eliminating four underfloor storages as part of this project. So about 25% of that capital cost is actually building new manure storage to replace the existing manure storage. So does the university have their own distribution and you don't have to worry about getting sacked for demand charges and so forth from the bulk of the utility and not getting the value off the years? We do, but in the case where we're at, we are actually on a public utility. Uh, we looked at burying our own line and, and driving it into campus, um, and it would have, we would have had to put a, a line in about three quarters of a mile to do that. Uh, but there is a provision in Michigan's Renewable Energy Act that allows a contiguous land base to utilize the uh, transmission lines of the public utilities with no uh, standby charges. You just have to pay your, your surcharges, your distribution fees. Uh, and you can offset your power. So we're actually using that provision as opposed to, to powering ourselves on campus. How important do you to export to students? Right now we're moving about 10 miles and uh, it's costing the project about 3.2 cents per gallon is what we budgeted for. So um, the next phase of this as we move forward is to start looking at how do we strip those nutrients out um, in, in time up either in the compost or in a more solid form so we can export them as a profit as well as, as opposed to a loss. We can use the water on campus. We can't use the phosphorus.